Good morning, everyone. It is uh, 11 a.m. on the dot, and we did say that this webinar would be getting started at 11. Um, so I just wanted to go ahead and get everything kicked off and uh, thank you all for uh, registering for the webinar and tuning in today. And I want to thank Larry as well um, for uh, helping organize this and getting this set up. Um, you there, Larry? Give a shout. He may have his mic muted. That's okay. Uh, I am here. here. There you go. Uh, if I'm if I'm correct, you're going to be recording this, Larry, and we're going to be putting this along with the slides up on the Leap Texas website. Correct? That is correct. Um, if you do have questions, and I hope you do have questions during uh, from the presentation today, um, please do enter those into the uh, chat window. Um, uh, Larry and I will be monitoring that. Um, if there's something pertinent that pops up that catches my during the presentation, I may uh, strive to address that at the moment. But um, if there are questions, I'm going to endeavor to leave some time um, at the end of the presentation uh, for us to go over those. So please do uh, put those in. So <clears throat> the uh, topic of today's webinar is using curriculum mapping to help drive assessment plan development. Um, I think this is a, as an important topic. It's something that I've spoken on before. I was glad to be able to do this webinar today on this and, and provide you all hopefully with some helpful tips and tricks that you can uh, employ at your institutions um, when you're looking at either helping to facilitate curriculum mapping as an assessment professional or conduct curriculum mapping if you are a faculty member, program lead, department chair, um, any of those roles. So let's go ahead and get started. So just some quick takeaways in terms of what curriculum mapping can do to help you um, and your, your areas. Uh, so these are, the, these are the kind of takeaways that I hope, hopefully that y'all will uh, end the webinar today with. Um, curriculum mapping can help you identify your programmatic learning outcomes. Um, this is oftentimes the first challenge for a lot of degree programs. Um, so it, it can be a very helpful tool for that. Uh, I can help you understand the paths that your students are taking um, through their programs or fields of study. Um, we sometimes think we have a good idea of, of the path that students are taking through our degree programs, but we may, we may not. It can help you identify the gaps that may exist in your programmatic student learning outcomes coverage. I think we've, we may have all heard stories or maybe you have, have been in the situation where you think that Professor X is teaching a concept so you don't teach it, and at the same time, Professor X is thinking that you're teaching the concept. Um, and so they don't teach it, and so no one teaches it. Um, that, that can be problematic. Um, curriculum mapping, of course, is a big tool in helping aid your curriculum planning and the design of your curriculum for your programs. And uh, then finally, in terms of the assessment perspective, curriculum mapping will help you be able to identify locations for assessment at the program level um, within your program's curriculum. So those are some good takeaways in terms of the, of the power of curriculum mapping and what it can do to help you. Um, I do want to kind of go over kind of the level that we're talking about today because you can, you can do assessment and you can do curriculum mapping at, uh, at multiple levels, at the assignment level, course level, program level, or the institutional level. And as a framework for today's conversation, we're talking about assessment and we're talking about curriculum mapping at the program levels. Um, however, I want to give the caveat that just like assessment, curriculum mapping can be done at all levels. It may look a little bit different, uh, but the concepts are basically the same. Um, if, you're, if you're talking about mapping at the assignment level, you're, you're mapping a, an assignment that you've created to specific learning outcomes. Um, you know, the classic example of that is, is a rubric for evaluating student project or a student essay. Uh, at the course level, you're mapping the learning outcomes that you're expecting the students to master across the delivery of a course. Um, we, we typically do this in our syllabi through um, uh, course outlines, uh, week by week. This is what we're going to be covering. This is what we expect you to be able to, to know and do. Program level, which we're going to be talking about today, you're mapping your, your student learning outcomes across an entire degree program or a course of study. And then finally, at the institutional level, you're just doing that at, at the macro level. Um, 
you're you're typically going to see that within something like the general education, uh, mapping your general education outcomes across your general education curriculum. Um, or um, although if you have a, a large uh, a program or specialty program, you may be doing that across that program as well. So this is a, a very important slide. Um, and I really want to hit upon these points as, as takeaways uh, for you today. And this information will come up again, so, so do remember it. Curriculum mapping must be faculty driven. Um, this is a big message that I am, try to impart to my faculty and staff at my university, and I hope that, that you will try to impart at your institution. This is a faculty owned, faculty driven process because it is a program faculty that should be collectively determining what the appropriate course programmatic student learning outcomes are what should be taught within the courses and how the course and programs should be structured, what should be assessed, when it is assessed and how, and what actions need to be taken for improvement based on the collective data. This is a collective process. This is a faculty driven process. Uh, I'm a director of assessment. I help facilitate these processes on my campus. I help facilitate these processes with our degree programs. I can advise, I can talk with them. I can help them think these things out, but I'm not a content expert in their areas. And I don't and I don't try to be. Um, they are the ones with the expertise. They are the ones with the knowledge. My faculty, I have to trust them to be able to, to drive these processes. <clears throat> this is this is, I think, one of the keys to good assessment and definitely to good curriculum mapping. Is that re regardless of the level that you're trying to accomplish these things, all mapping and assessment starts with quality student learning outcomes. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that here uh, because I think it is very important. Um, hopefully, most everyone should be familiar with the student learning outcome or a definition of what one is. If not, we have some definitions here. Uh, a classic one is uh, Banta and Paloma from 20, uh, their work in 2015, assessment, I think it was assessment essentials. Uh, the expected student learning or behavior in, pre in precise terms providing guidance for what needs to be assessed. Um, and then you have some Jeff Roberts guy who likes to say that uh, student learning outcome that is, is the stuff and things you expect your students to be able to know and do because you taught it to them. Bit tongue in cheek. Um, legitimately, when I'm talking to my degree programs and my colleges and my departments about what programmatic student learning outcomes is, this is this is kind of an operational definition that I've created, and and I think it. It fits pretty well because when I'm when you're thinking about learning at the program level and what students should be able to know and demonstrate, it's the necessary knowledge, skills, and abilities that the students are gaining through the course of their educational programs, which hopefully they should be able to successfully demonstrate at the point of completion of their degree or program. So that's the easy part, defining the concept. But I'm here to tell you today that without clearly defined student learning outcomes, um, effective curriculum mapping and assessment just is not possible. It's going to be very difficult for you to do. You have to start with good outcomes in place. So what are some general tips and tricks for what good student learning outcomes, um, how they, what they should be? What makes a good student learning outcome? I oftentimes get that question on my campus. And I try to tell people that a good SLO should not be overly broad or generic, that it should be detailing the specific knowledge or skills that you're expecting the students to be able to know or demonstrate. And you need to, to define it and state it in a way that you can measure it. If you, if it, if, if you can't do those three things, then, then there's going to be problems with the outcome as you have defined it. And I should say that I'm using the, the term student learning uh, outcome oftentimes here. You may use the word objective at your institution. I'm using them synonymously. It's OK. So what are some not so good examples of student learning outcomes? I think we've all seen this one before. My favorite one that I don't like to see, students will demonstrate a mastery of, no, of all the knowledge necessary for the discipline. That is, that is far too broad and generic to be of any use to any program ever. Another great oldie but goodie, students will get an A and their underwater basket weaving 3304 weaving baskets in shallow water course. Problematic because 
we're talking about course grades and course grades don't speak specifically to student attainment and learning of specific objectives. It's a lot of things that go into a student's grade in a course that may not be related to learning. One of my favorites from the graduate level, students will successfully defend their dissertation. Several issues with an outcome like that. Um, first of all, we're, we're convoluting learning with program requirements. Um, you know, they have to successfully defend the dissertation to complete the program. Um, that does not speak. There's, in, there's lots of things that go into a successful dissertation that are, are learning related. The ability to conduct research, the ability to um, think critically, the ability to uh, uh, to uh, present information, the ability to write clearly and, and efficiently. Um, all of those could be learning outcomes. The successful defense of the dissertation isn't a learning outcome. Um, and, and we also have an issue of with an outcome like that, that um, if a doctoral program is sending lots of students to the dissertation phase into the defense state phase and not expecting them to be successful, then, um, then we have a we have a bigger problem with <laughs> that degree program that they may want to look at. All right, we've talked a lot about learning outcomes. We've talked a lot about assessment. Um, we haven't actually shown you an example curriculum map yet, and I'm going to do that here in about uh, about 30 seconds, hopefully. Um, but I do want to talk about what the characteristics characteristics of a curriculum map are. It's a very simple concept on its head though it can be difficult to put into practice. Um, and we're going to be, you know, kind of talking about the classic curriculum map today. Um, within a classic curriculum map, it is essentially a matrix, a matrices, a matrix um, with student learning outcomes clearly identified along one of the axes of the matrix. And then the programmatic course offerings or the course sequence along the other axis. And the points of intersection are hopefully where you're incorporating the uh, student learning outcomes. Um, and many of the maps you will see will have levels of emphasis, uh, where a student learning outcome is being introduced, being reinforced, or being mastered along the course of study. And uh, I did see someone, as a, an aside, someone asked uh, whether or not the slides and uh, recording will be available. Yes, they will be. So let's take a look at this example curriculum map. Um, and I will give the caveat that this is not necessarily a great curriculum map. We will look at a better example here in just a few minutes. Uh, but this curriculum map on the slide here currently uh, does have all of the, the classic hallmarks of what a curriculum map is. If we look along, let's see if I can pull up the laser pointer here real quick. Uh, we have the course sequence along one of our axes. This is our example degree program uh, of, of in underwater basket weaving. We have along the other axis, the programmatic learning outcomes that have been identified. And of course, we're just using generic numbers here, but for your specific degree program, I would encourage you to either define these within the cells or at least have a crosswalk where you know what SLO1 means. And the more specific that learning outcome, the better. And then we can look a lot across the curriculum map and we can see the points of intersection. So we can see, for example, where SLO1 is being introduced in the curriculum here in UBAW 1330, where the concept is being reinforced in UBAW 2680, and then eventually uh, students being expected to demonstrate mastery of that concept in a 4,000 level course, UBAW 4280, it's probably a capstone course or something along those lines where they're expected to, to demonstrate mastery of the knowledge. And we can see that for our other outcomes as well, points of introduction, reinforcement, and where the students expect to master it. So how is a curriculum map useful? And I'm gonna go forward one slide and then we're gonna come back to our example map. So I want to hit these three points before I go back to the example map and kind of show you on that. Maps are going to help you identify those programmatic student learning outcomes that are not being covered within your curriculum. Maps are going to help identify your SLOs that may be inadequately addressed. 
and maps can help you identify the courses that are not covering any of your programmatic SLOs. So if we go back and look at this, we can see, for example, uh, a programmatic student learning outcome that is not being covered within the curriculum here on this map is student learning outcome number nine. And we, we can think of examples where we've heard of this in, in actuality, where, as I said at the, at the start of the, of the presentation, a learning outcome that you think somebody else is teaching and they think that you're teaching and everyone thinks that maybe a third person is teaching that uh, learning outcome in their course and no one is teaching it and it is not being covered. You may also have instances where learning outcomes are not being adequately covered within the curriculum. Some examples of that here are uh, student learning outcome three on this map. Um, Potentially, this is an issue. You have a learning outcome that is not being introduced within the curriculum, but it is being reinforced and, and, and students are expected to demonstrate a mastery of it um, uh, in, in other courses. SLO number five, similar situation. No introduction, no reinforcement. We're just expecting students to be able to demonstrate mastery of it um, at the 4,000 level. SLO seven, concepts being introduced, no opportunities for practice or reinforcement throughout the curriculum, just an expectation that students will demonstrate mastery of it at the 4,000 level. SLO 10, concept that's being introduced and reinforced, but no um, expectation that the students will demonstrate mastery of it. Now, these could be problematic, they could potentially not be. Depends on the importance of the student learning outcomes. And this is where a conversation has to take place with you and your faculty in terms of what's important for our students. Um, maybe for SLO 3, there's an expectation that students should be coming with an introductory knowledge of that topic. That's a possibility. Maybe it is incumbent upon the department or the program to reinforce that knowledge within the curriculum and expect students to demonstrate a mastery of it. Same thing potentially for SLO 5. SLO 10 could be a situation where um, that is a learning outcome that is nice for the students to have, but it isn't pivotal to student success within a field or discipline. So we're going to introduce it. We're going to give some opportunity to practice it. But in terms of all of the long list of student learning outcomes for this program, it's one that we don't need to hit at the end of experience. We don't need to, uh, the students to demonstrate complete mastery of that, and that's okay. Um, those are conversations that a program has to have. And this is where a curriculum map can be useful in terms of, okay, what is appropriate? What is not? Do we need to do a better job of reinforcing some of these learning outcomes? Or are we needing to make sure that we're introducing them to the students in the curriculum? Or we need to be finding uh, ways to allow the students to demonstrate mastery of them at the end of the curriculum. Those are conversation that's, conversations that the faculty need to have. So let's talk about how this can help you reflect on your own program's curriculum design. And these are just, if I was doing this workshop in a, in a live setting, this is something that we would have some conversation around, uh, maybe even small groups. Of course, with the webinar, we can't do this. So I want these to be guiding questions to you as uh, you think and reflect on this presentation um, over lunch here in about uh, 40 minutes. Does your program have uh, does your program curriculum have a design? That is a tough question for some folks. Oftentimes the answer is maybe. Oftentimes the answer is, well, yeah, we think we do. Sometimes the answer is, well, we don't really have a design. We just have an offering of classes. Does your curriculum have a clear sequence of courses through which students progress? Is it a structured curriculum or is it a um, like I, uh, the, the opposite of that, I like to call the buffet style, where students are able to select from a wide range of classes to satisfy the degree requirements and kind of chart their own course. Choose your own adventure to, uh, to a degree program. If you do have a clear sequence of courses, um, is your course sequencing addressing all of your programmatic learning outcomes? If not, you need to have some thoughts about that. You need to have some conversation about that. <clears throat> Four programs that are the buffet style approach, and those can work. There's nothing wrong with that, but it is incumbent upon the department of the program to make sure that if you do have a curriculum that students can pick and choose 
from a menu of multiple course offerings that you still have a way and a plan in place to ensure that your key learning outcomes are being covered throughout your curriculum and that students are getting those programmatic learning outcomes as they're progressing. You don't want students graduating at the end of the program lacking in key learning outcomes that you want them to have because they picked courses that didn't quite work. So such curriculums can work and they can be mapped, but it comes, but it, but it will give you the caveat that it does get a lot more messy. And then finally, um, do you have outside accreditation requirements or professional standards impacting your curriculum that are going to be impacting your curriculum design? Um, and if you're in those programs, you know you are. Um, I'm thinking of educational preparation programs. I'm thinking of nursing programs. I'm thinking of engineering programs with ABET accreditation. They're very prescribed in terms of students, thou shalt do this. Students will be able to accomplish X. Um, curriculum must deliver Y. Um, so if you do have those outside elements, how does that impact your curriculum design? How does that impact your curriculum map? So I said a few minutes ago that we would get to a more robust example of a curriculum map. Um, this one still isn't perfect, but I think that this one might look more like what a robust good curriculum map would look like for a program. In this map, we can see that we've addressed the issues from before. Um, we can see that all of our learning outcomes are being introdu introduced at appropriate points within the curriculum, typically at the introductory level. We can see that each outcome is being reinforced to lesser or greater degrees throughout the remainder of the curriculum and that there's an expectation that students will demonstrate mastery of each learning outcome at a capstone level. So let's reflect upon your program's current and future assessment needs. And once again, these are guiding questions for you to consider as um, you digest this presentation and think about curriculum mapping at, at your campus or for your program. So I mentioned already um, whether or not your program might have outside accreditation requirements or professional standards that are driving your program assessment. Similarly, from your, your curriculum designing and your learning outcomes, I'm thinking of uh, professional licensure programs, I'm thinking of uh, teacher education programs, I'm thinking of uh, uh, ABET accredited programs for engineering, uh, APA potentially for psychology. Um, I'm sure I already mentioned nursing, but I'm going to say nursing again because they get hammered with a lot of this sort of stuff. And you also need to be thinking about what types of assessment you are interested in. Are you interested in doing formative assessment, summative assessment, pre-post assessment, or all of the above? Um, and uh, hopefully you're familiar with those terms, but I will give uh, a little quick definitions. Formative assessment, you're assessing at the beginning of experience. The idea that we're assessing at the start of, of a student's program or start assessing at the start of a class in order to gain a sense of where the students are at at the beginning so we can still make changes to those students through some sort of intervention through either whether it be within a course or within a program that we have a chance to mold and shape them uh, hopefully for the better before they reach the point of graduation. Summative assessment is typically looking at the end of experience. We're looking at how the students did at the very end. Um, at the point of graduation or at the point of the end of the course um, collecting data on that. We can use summative data in a formative way in the sense that we can use that data to inform changes to earlier portions of a curriculum or earlier portions of a course that will hopefully influence the next generation of students. But with a summative assessment, you have to realize that the students that you assessed are gone, that your chance for impacting those students um, has ended, and that any weaknesses they have, they have. Pre-post is in many ways combining both formative and summative assessment uh, with a 
with the pre-post assessment, uh, you're seeing that you oftentimes at the course level, you can also see that at program level, we assess them at the beginning, we assess them at the end, and oftentimes with pre-post, we are looking for value added. Um, and a robust program assessment, hopefully you're doing all of these. Hopefully you are doing more formative assessments at the beginning of experience to get an idea of where students are coming into your program, what levels of knowledge they have, where are they weak, where are they strong. Hopefully you are doing summative assessment at the end of the program to see where the students are standing on your key learning outcomes, what have they mastered, what are they still weak in uh, at the point of graduation or program completion. Um, hopefully you're using these assessments in a pre-post fashion um, to see student growth over time, um, see strengths and weaknesses, see areas where students are lagging behind and being able to make changes to the curriculum along the way to address um, those weaknesses. <clears throat> Thinking more specifically about how we can embed assessment within the curriculum, uh, you need to also be thinking about the types of assessment measures that you're going to be using. So are you wanting to use course embedded assessment, artifact sampling, a mixture of both? Course embedded assessments being assessments that you're actually embedding within a course or potentially um, taking an assignment out of the course. Uh, you know, you uh, have a professor that uh, offers, uh, that has the students complete a research paper within the course. Um, and they have a very detailed grading rubric for that. And the faculty can get behind going, you know, that is a key course in our curriculum. That grading rubric is great. We're going to basically just lift those scores on that assignment out of the course and use that as a program assessment measure. That's perfectly fine. Are you wanting to do artifact sampling? Whereby we have um, six sections of a, a writing enhanced course and we don't feel like uh, evaluating 600 student essays um, in the program. So we're going to sample out 10 essays from each of those courses, score them as a group of faculty with a locally developed rubric, um, and uh, only score 60 of those. That's perfectly acceptable as well. You have to think about what assessments you currently have in place for your program. Where can you already pull existing data? When I'm talking with my programs on my campus, um, this is where I always go first. I always ask them, what do you already have in place that you can use before you start building new and creating new assessments? Are those assessments in the right places within your curriculum? Um, I'm just going to go back a few slides here. Just bear with me because I want to go back to this map. If you are trying to assess SL01 here, for example, in UBAW 2290, you're going to have a real hard time assessing that outcome in that class because that outcome in, is not being introduced, reinforced, or anything in that class. So making sure that your assessments are in the right place, that you're looking in the right place for artifacts for the student learning outcome um, is important and is where a curriculum map can help you with that. So let's go back forward. Just bear with me as I slide through those. <clears throat> Just as I was mentioning, this is where curriculum maps come in handy. From an assessment plan design standpoint, when I talk to faculty about curriculum mapping and how it can be used in this way, I want them to look at the intersections between the courses that they're offering and the student learning outcomes for their program. It is those points of intersection that are going to represent the potential locations for you to either embed assessments, find embedded assessments for those learning outcomes, or to collect artifacts that you can score outside of the classroom. That is where the authentic learning is taking place. The concepts are being taught in those classes at various levels of attainment. Um, you have artifacts there or assignments there or assessments already there, hopefully, that you can pull from. 
but you also have to keep in mind that you need to be assessing it at the appropriate level. So if you're pulling course artifacts or you're looking at student performance in an introductory course for an outcome, then the level of student performance on that outcome will probably be lower, hopefully will be lower, than you would see if you pulled similar artifacts um, or pulled uh, different assessments for that same outcome at the 4,000 level or the end of experience level. So you need to tailor your expectations and tailor your assessments appropriately to, to the expectation of the, of, of the student learning at that level. Your curriculum app is also going to help you identify um, where the different levels of, of learning can be assessed. So if you're wanting to do formative assessment, you need to be embedding your assessments within introductory level courses. You need to be uh, embedding those in courses where the concepts are being, re, uh, being introduced or reinforced. Then you need to be embedding your summative assessments in those areas where the student learning is expecting that the students are expected to demonstrate mastery of that learning. And then, as I mentioned, this is going to allow you to, to conduct those assessments at the appropriate level. I have seen examples within my own degree programs at my own institution where they are doing program level assessment for a learning outcome. And the only assessments for that own learning outcome are coming from one and 2000 level courses, introductory courses. <clears throat> From a formative assessment standpoint, that's perfectly fine. But that doesn't tell me anything about student mastery of those topics as they approach graduation, where the students are doing, how the students are doing with that information, with those knowledge, with those skills um, as they approach graduation. Your curriculum app is also going to help you identify the best locations for assessing the student learning outcomes. As we talked about, um, those points of intersection are, are going to be where you're going to want to embed assessments or look for data. Um, so as you're designing an assessment plan for your degree program and you look at those points of intersection, you should be asking yourself, are course level data already available for those outcomes? If so, make use of it. Double dip. Don't ask people to do extra work if they don't have to. Your faculty will love you for it. I promise you. Um, if course level data aren't directly available, if, a, if an assignment, a direct assessment isn't being done, um, are there artifacts that you could use for assessment at the program level? And this is where I'm talking about pulling out artifacts, sampling papers, sampling projects, sampling assignments or being able to, even if you aren't using sampling, if you're using a census sample, where you're gonna take all of the papers from multiple sections or multi, uh, all of the, uh, the student projects or all of the assignments, where those can be identified, where those can, can take place, where you can pull those out to be used at the program level. Again, you're making use of what is already there. And then, only then, if, you know, the first part here you know, that there are no course level data available, that there aren't any student learning artifacts that you can pull out of those courses that could be used for program evaluation. <clears throat> then and only then should you be looking to create new assessments that you could then hopefully introduce into those courses. Only when you've exhausted number one and number two here should you be looking to create new assessments. So the takeaways that I would like you to walk away from today with this presentation. Um, hopefully you're going to see or you have seen that curriculum mapping can be helpful to your programs as you think about how to organize your curriculum and, and, and define your student learning outcomes. This is a brainstorming activity, if anything else. If, if that's all you get out of it is your program has a better understanding of your student learning outcomes, that is an accomplishment in of itself. At the next step, curriculum mapping can be useful to you in designing and implementing an effective assessment plan. It's going to allow you to hopefully, if you have your learning outcomes well-defined and your curriculum is, is structured um, in such a way that you can, you can map to it, 
you can find those points of intersection between student learning outcome and course offering that student learning outcome to know where to look for, for assessment data. <clears throat> but it is important to remember that just like everything in higher education, there is no magic bullet. Curriculum, ma curriculum mapping is not a magic bullet. It is going to take some work and it's going to take some effort. Garbage in, garbage out. You need to have a good understanding of your student learning outcomes and your curriculum for curriculum mapping to work well. Um, that's a big key. If you don't have a good understanding of your student learning outcomes, if you don't have a good hand on your curriculum structure, <clears throat> those are important first steps to work through first before you start curriculum mapping. And the, the reason is, is quite frankly, that poorly developed and defined student learning outcomes and, and haphazard curriculum design is going to make this task very difficult. If, you're, if your student learning outcomes are, are too broad and too generic, um, they're going to map to nothing or they're going to map to everything. Um, if you have a curriculum that is very loose in its structure and its definition, where you know the paths that students can take through the curriculum are, are many and varied and there isn't good control in terms of, of ensuring that, that um, those paths that students do take, that there's there's adequate coverage of the curriculum, uh, average, adequate coverage of the student learning outcomes, it's going to be difficult to do this. Um, but here's a hard truth. Poorly developed student learning outcomes and the haphazard curriculum design also make for very problematic student learning. If you don't know what your students are supposed to know, then I can pretty much guarantee you that the students probably don't know it either. Um, if, as a program, you don't have a good hand on the path that the students are taking through your courses and, and structuring that curriculum in such a way that you're making sure that students are engaging in and being exposed to all of the learning they need to be successful in whatever field or discipline they're going to go into upon graduation, they're not going to have those skills in place. They're going to be struggling. So there is a secret. Curriculum mapping must be faculty driven. If you remember, this is one of the very first slides I showed you and it's come back. Um, this is my final big takeaway. This process has to be faculty driven. It is the faculty that know what the appropriate course and programmatic student learning outcomes should be. If they don't know them already, they are the ones that need to define them. They're the ones that know or should define what is being taught within the courses and how the course and program curriculum should be structured. They're the ones that should know what should be assessed, when it is being assessed and how. And they're the ones that are needing to develop the actions in response to the data to drive curriculum improvement. So with that, um, I'm going to bring the presentation to an end and we have 40 minutes, which is about what I wanted in terms of, of any questions that you might have uh, about curriculum mapping, about uh, how you can make it work for your program. Um, I'm happy to address any of those and, and go into those. So uh, feel free to, to enter those into the chat box. Don't be shy. So I did um, get one good question here. Thank you, Larry. What is the biggest challenge that uh, I have faced in mapping? Um, <clears throat> the biggest challenge has oftentimes been um, I'll say it's two things, as, and this is coming from the perspective of an assessment director. Um, just exposing faculty to the concept of curriculum mapping. It has been surprising to me 
um, and I don't know if it's true at every institution, um, though it is, I, anecdotally, to a lot of the folks I've talked to at other institutions, um, it seems to be true at their institutions to a degree as well. Curriculum mapping isn't always the most familiar subject to higher education faculty. Um, it is something that is seen much more in um, K-12 education, I think, um, but it is an excellent tool for us to use here. Um, so just familiarizing people with what curriculum mapping is, is a, um, is a, is the first challenge. And then the second challenge is really getting the programs to define good student learning outcomes. Um, that is such a driving force to, to anything assessment and curriculum related. The program needs to know what it is that their students need to know in order for this sort of process to work. Um, and in getting quality, well-defined, well-articulated student learning outcomes that truly cover the full depth and breadth of knowledge for a degree or for an educational program is an important first step for this to work well. <clears throat> so I'm gonna take these in, in order. Do, 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 do. So Elizabeth, for program and learning outcomes, I see introductory and reinforced assessment is formative. I see mastery is summative. Is this correct? Is or is this or is there another way to think about it? <clears throat> um, I think that in in general, that is not a bad way to approach it. Although I will, you know, give the um, favorite. Uh, answer I always get in anything in any question I ever asked at the SACS annual meeting. Um, it depends. Um, you can do it, it all depends on the the level and locus of control and the level that you're looking at. So you can do formative and summative assessment within a 4,000 level class, a capstone course, where you assess at the beginning of the course and you assess the, at the end of the course. Um, You know, and you can reasonably do that if you can re reasonably manipulate what's going on within the course and hopefully um, uh, improve the student learning. At the end of experience at a program level, there may not be a whole lot that you as a program can do to correct something within those students that you're seeing. So the value of a formative assessment declines the closer the students are getting to the end of experience, depending on the outcome. Um, so with with concepts still being introduced and reinforced, you have a chance to manipulate that to some extent in terms of the student learning, intervene on their behalf, figure out ways to 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 make changes along the way. Um, so hopefully that that answers your question to to that end. Um, but it it's really what what works in terms of y'all's design. <clears throat> Describe how you and your stakeholders revisit maps after established for updates, et cetera. This is a good question. Um, I would encourage you to think about baking this into your ongoing curricular review process. Um, once you have a good map established, once you've done this process once meaningfully in terms of, of really thought about your learning outcomes, thought about your core sequencing, got, <clears throat> got that into shape, it's not something that you have to necessarily go back and revisit year after year in terms of an annual process. Y'all should be looking at it on an annual basis, but you don't need to be revising it on an annual basis because your curriculum probably isn't drastically changing from year to year. Um, however, um, you know, I think most programs are doing some sort of curricular review um, on a cyclical basis. And if they aren't, they should be um, because curriculums change over time. Expectations of the field and discipline change over time. We have, <clears throat> we can always point to um, what I call curriculum creep. Um, where, you know, a course is proposed and approved and it's taught in a certain way for a number of years and then another faculty member comes in and goes, oh, I'm going to change this up a little bit and do this. The field's changed a little bit and the course is going to do this now and rinse and repeat through three or four faculty members. And suddenly the course that is now being taught doesn't look anything like the course that was originally proposed. It isn't covering the same learning. Um, so you do need, as you, as you are reviewing your curriculum, um, on a cyclical basis, I would encourage you to, to do this curriculum mapping um, as part of that process and to use that as a driver of your, of your curricular review um, uh, process to go, okay, are our courses still doing what we want them to do? 
have we had some creep in our courses where courses are no longer covering what they used to be covering? How do we address those gaps? Um, are learning outcomes changing over time? Um, are some, you know, increasing importance or some um, reducing importance? Um, do we need to, to modify our core sequence? Is there a course that just needs to go away? Do we have courses that need to be added in? So doing that <clears throat> is a uh, periodic process can be very helpful. Question from Tina. I find that the assessment rubric development we align with assessing outcomes on our curriculum maps is the hardest for our faculty. Do you find this to be true as well? Um, it can be. Um, you know, that is, you know, I, I say that this needs to be a faculty driven process um, and it does need to be a faculty driven process, but I say it like that's an easy thing. <laughs> Um, and it oftentimes is not. Um, getting a group of faculty to agree on uh, what the learning outcomes need to be, how they need to be assessed, um, where those assessments need to take place, and then actually getting the buy-in in terms of, okay, and then we actually have to do it, is not an easy task. I fully acknowledge that. But I think that for it to be authentic, for it to be meaningful, that it needs to be faculty driven because that gives faculty ownership of the process is in the skin in the game and it feels then less like something that is being forced upon them from an outside agency or an outside administrator like myself and something that they have ownership of. Um, so it's going to be messy. Doing that sort of alignment, doing that sort of mapping and design is going to be messy. But I always tell my faculty that the best assessment is messy. Um, if it's clean, cookie cutter, fits in a box nicely, neatly. Um, it isn't telling me as much. <clears throat> How much awareness? This is uh, from a Joe Pham, and I apologize if I mispronounce that. How much awareness does the entire campus have of the existence and content of curriculum maps? Is it shared among all faculty, and including adjuncts? Do you highlight it? With students as part of your syllabi online or somewhere else. Um, and this is where I'm going to say in all fairness and, and due diligence, this is something we're not doing a great job of at my institution. Um, I'm preaching the message. Um, I'm starting to see some converts here or there um, within certain majors and programs and, and colleges, but we're still at the beginning phases for a lot of this. Um, hopefully your institution is a little bit better. I can tell you in a perfect world that the answer to that would be yes, that the campus should have broader existence of these content and curriculum maps, um, that that it shouldn't be state secrets. And it should be shared, at least within the program or the department, with all of the faculty. And if you're not including adjuncts in your assessment as you can, and I understand that there's contract issues and time issues um, around our contingent and adjunct faculty, but they're teaching the courses too. And they at least need to be informed and aware of what the expectations are in terms of these are the student learning outcomes and these are the key assessments that we expect you to use. If you're coming in teaching in CAN curriculum in terms of here's the syllabi, here's the basic course structure, <clears throat> having some basic expectations in terms of and this is what the students will be able to do when they finish your course. And here are some key commonly agreed upon assessments that we're using is important. Um, and this is something that you can also do to help highlight this information with the students as well. Um, like I said earlier, if the students, if you don't win, as I said earlier, if you don't know what the students are supposed to know, the students won't know what they're supposed to know either. <clears throat> but a good way of making sure that students know what they're supposed to know is to tell them what they're supposed to know. That's not cheating. To, to let them know what the learning outcomes are for a course at the very beginning. And having a curriculum app will, will help with that. Um, and it may also help programs as they're tackling the, the marketable skills issue, um, help define those concepts, identify those, on, those concepts and, and demonstrate those concepts.
Uh, Tina added, <clears throat> added in a comment, and I apologize for getting a cough here. Am I uh, dealing with a bit of a head cold? Tina stated to add a comment to Jennifer's at uh, AC. If the department presents a curriculum committee with a program revision that may impact the courses and PLOs on the map, they are required to submit a new map with their curriculum committee petition. I think that's a good uh, good idea. Joe, no, we could be better in increasing awareness too. It's comforting to know we're around the same stages of assessment development. Um, I'm, you know, we're. I think a lot of us are in that same boat. Um, that's probably pretty common uh, for a lot of institutions. So, you know, don't don't feel bad. We're all in we're all in the same situation together. Any extra questions? Yes, revisiting the map. I think that's an that is an important step. Jennifer just said thank you for, for the suggestion about <clears throat> about revisiting the map. Um, yeah, as you review your your curriculum, you need to be reviewing these curriculum maps, and and the curriculum map can be a, a driving um, force in that. Um. If there aren't any other questions, um, we can go ahead and, and wrap up. And I'm going to finish the presentation today with a shameless plug <coughs> for the seventh annual Leap Texas Conference uh, 2020, the promise of a new decade for higher education, March 29th through 31st, 2020, at the Houston Hilton North. We have a great lineup of speakers and pre conference workshops. Um, the conference agenda is out on the website. If you have not, already registered for the conference and you're wanting to attend, please go do so. Um, the hotel <clears throat> the hotel block is filling up, so get in there before the availability runs out um, and do consider registering and attending. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there if you've already registered and hopefully we'll see the rest of you there as well. Larry, I'll turn it back over to you now. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. We appreciate it. We appreciate everybody who uh, participated today. And um, we look forward to seeing all of you at the conference, and we hope you will join us in uh, Houston. The recording and PowerPoint will be up on the website. Probably give us a day uh, to get that uh, put up. And also, I will send a notice out to everyone who registered by email, and I'll send a notice out on the uh, Lake Texas web serve, uh, list serve, excuse me, that it's available. So thank you, Jeff. We appreciate it. Great presentation. Uh, great questions. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody have a great day.